Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in for another edition of Live with Lenny. This is Zach Dittmarsh for Fish Talk Magazine. Uh, tonight's topic is tributary treats. So the wind is howling and the open bay is off limits, but you don't want to give up your day of fishing. Well, there's some great action in the tributaries right now, and you can almost always find sheltered waters inside a trip. So tonight we'll go from north to south and cover the tactics you need to know to take advantage of these cool opportunities north of the Bay Bridge, from the Bay Bridge to Point Lookout, and into the lower portion of the bay. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to our angler in chief, Mr. Lenny Rudo. Hey, Lenny, how you doing? Hello, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Uh, working from home for a bit, but uh, life is good. Good. Excellent. So uh, I guess before we start get started, we want to thank our sponsor, Suzuki Marine. Um, I you know, I'll give you a quick Suzuki story. You ready? I'd love to hear it. You ready? So my boat's got a lot of hours on it, right? It's it's pushing 2,000, and those things, knocking on wood here, have been a charm. I got a pair of 90s on it, and they have been amazing. And someone said to me the other day, oh, I should explain. I'm waiting on a new boat, but I've still got the old boat. Thank goodness. And so the old boat's going to be with me until the new boat comes. And in the meantime, these folks got on the boat, and they're like, oh, how old are those motors? Like three, four years old? And I'm like, no. <laughs> They're 2008s with 2,000 hours on them. You turn the key, vroom. So I love that Suzuki sponsors us for this. It's really easy for me to talk nice about their motors because I've had such darn good luck with them. I love them. Excellent. Well, if you're interested in a repower or just looking for service on your Suzuki, hop on over to fishtalkmag.com backslash, or is that forward slash Suzuki, and you'll find a, a whole host of regional Suzuki dealers and service providers. It's a slash. Honestly, I can never tell the difference. Well, like, what is a backslash and what is a forward slash? It's Does one, anybody really know? It's like, yeah, one goes one way, one goes uh, the other. You know, I don't know. Ask a web developer. <laughs> All right. All right. So should we jump right into these tributary options? Let's do it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Didn't we have one other announcement? Uh, we sure did. Thanks for the around. cover contest. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the fish talk. Fishing Kids Cover Contest. Submissions end today, August 4th. And then um, once we, you know, kind of filter out the uh, qualifying images, you know, we need a lot of headroom for the Fish Talk logo. Just take a look at the cover. You'll get an idea. There's the guidelines on our website. Um, anyway, it's uh, any any kids, Chesapeake Bay, Mid-Atlantic region, specific fish species, freshwater, saltwater, and then tomorrow voting will begin. And goes through the 11th, and the winner will be on the September cover of Fish Talk Magazine. So, any kids, fishing kids' dream can come true. So, for all you regular humans out there who aren't production managers, when Zach says leave headroom, what that means is you need space at the top of the picture. You gotta have sky or something. You can't like cut off someone's forehead right here, or the words Fish Talk will go right across their face. So, you gotta make sure you leave that. What is it, about a third? Is that about right? So, when you have. Right. Yeah, we got a nice guidelines here for you. That's actually Nick Long. Uh, actually, it was just on a cover, but a great cover. <laughs> that was a great cover. So, yeah, so just leave a little room at the top, leave a little room at the bottom, send the pictures on in. Some kid's going to be really happy. He's going to be on the cover. I can't wait to see who it is. Very cool. And we'd like to thank uh, Fish and Hunt Maryland for presenting that cover contest. Rock it. All right. Let's get to tributaries and this is this is a topic that through the years it comes up over and over again because look let's face it you know a lot of times you get ready to go fishing the day before you're looking at the weather and it says oh good gravy it's going to be blowing 20 knots what do you do well the answer is in the chesapeake bay you can almost always find somewhere to hide from the wind the tributaries is just magnificent the way the bay curves all around and the shoreline goes crazy it means you can, like, if the wind's out of the west, you find a triple on the western shore. If it's out of the east, you can go to a triple on the eastern shore. North, south, you, you can always find cover in the tributaries. And with some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, I have some direct examples uh, of when that has happened to me and how I've managed to take a day that, you know, I might have said, oh, I'm just not even going to go fishing, and instead turn it into a bang-up day. So, uh, Zach, why don't you go ahead and throw up photo number one. I'm going to thank Wayne for chipping on the Coast Guard. I didn't know that. That's new to me. Uh, so this is not going to shock anybody. We're going to start north and work our way south. And 
when you're up north, or actually, I mean, this fish kind of goes <laughs> all the way around the dial these days. Uh, the big old catfish, they are everywhere. Now, for the the uh, the southern guys, you can always go way up, you know, the Rapids, James, whatever. Uh, the northern guys, this is a little newer, but it's really become a big thing. And, you know, it's funny. I had some folks out on the boat the day before yesterday. Super cool people. They live all the way in Pennsylvania. They keep their boat on Middle River. They drive all the way down every time. God bless them. And uh, the, the two guys on this boat, they, they had just bought new boats themselves in the last couple of years. Uh, relatively small boats. They can't go out when the wind is pumping. But they have had a great time this year by just catching catfish. And no matter how hard the wind blows, you know, you can always find a spot in the middle over, drop the anchor, catch a catfish. So tactics, not a whole lot to talk about. It's pretty darn simple. Uh, you know, weight your bait down, get it on bottom, cut fish. Uh, chicken livers. Chicken livers work surprisingly well, and they actually stay on the hook surprisingly well. Just make sure you put it through that little rough part in the middle, that uh, little bit of gristle. They'll stay on there. And uh, man, catfish munch them up. All right, Zach, go ahead and take us on to the next one. Now, here, here's another one that, you know, I put it in here for north, but truly it goes up and down the bay, and that's your white perch option. Now, white perch in a lot of areas have been tougher to catch this year and kind of last year too, uh, as opposed to what we would have said historically. It used to be you could go out and just, you know, catch as many of the darn things as you want. Uh, the last couple of years, they've been a little thinner. Now, where they have been biting a little better is in the deeper water over the shell bottom. It's really been the shallows, uh, you know, casting up on the edges that has been a lot harder to find them. From what I'm hearing from folks who are fishing on a regular basis for perch, they can still find them in the deep water on the shell bottom. So whatever tributary you might be near, what you really want to look for is, say, 12 to 18 feet of water uh, with a shell bottom or a rocky bottom, something hard, not just your regular mud bottom. Uh, simple bottom rig does the, trick. You, does the trick. You can bait it with bloodworms. You can bait it with grass shrimp. Um, you know, bloodworms only cost about $8 million a bag these days. So you might want to opt for something else, but uh, they do work like a charm. Uh, fish bites, really good option. They work really well in the summertime in the bay. All you need is a tiny little piece, you know, a half an inch long. Put it on like a, uh, a number six or a number four hook. Drop it down to the bottom. Drift, let the boat drift. Just drag along. You'll catch plenty of these guys. If you really get on them good, anchor on them. And you can just sit there and bail them one after the next. Uh, Chesapeake sabikis do seem to work even better than bottom rigs. They're just little sabiki rigs with two little flies on there. Again, you just tip them, tiny little piece of bloodworm, tiny little piece of fish bites, something like that. They will tear them up. And uh, there, I don't, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's a single tributary on the bay where you can't go catch these fellas, uh, no matter how rough it may get out. All right, let's go on to the next one, Zach. <clears throat> now, you know, the pictures never do the conditions justice. It's kind of hard to tell. But I remember this day. This was actually really rough. This is inside the Magathy River. Uh, and we were on a 16-foot Carolina skiff. There was absolutely, positively, no way we were going out into the open bay on this day. So we decided just to stay in the river, make a day of it. And it went great. We caught, uh, oh, gosh, I don't remember how many, but... Lots and lots of fish, just like this one he's holding here. Uh, say 15 to 21 inches. Uh, certainly keepers in the mix. And, uh, you know, really, it turned out just fine. We didn't mind that we couldn't go out on the bay. Not a bit. Rockfish like this, I, I do want to mention one particular thing about the tributary rockfish. And it's, it's interesting to me because it's only become clear to me in the last few years. Um, you can have a shoreline with 30 piers along it, right? And piers hold rockfish. But out of those 30 piers, you're probably only going to find one, two, maybe three that regularly hold fish. If you spend a couple days fishing your local tributary, you'll figure out which these piers are, right? You'll just, you know, take three or four casts at each pier and keep going, keep moving till you identify the hot ones. And what, what really just struck me recently is the hot ones change. 
And a pier might be the hot pier in that particular creek or river for you know three, four, five years. And then one season, for whatever reason, you go there and you don't catch fish anymore. And guess what? One of those other 30 piers, which never used to produce fish, suddenly starts producing producing fish. And I got no idea why this is, but I've watched this happen in the South River. Some of my old faithfuls have stopped being productive. And others that really didn't hold fish for years and years and years are suddenly holding fish. So I don't know what the deal is. They're fish. They got tails. They move. They do weird things. Who knows? I, I can't ask them, and they're not telling me. But uh, I guess the short story is, if you're fishing the tribs for rockfish, stay on the move, learn which piers are good, hit them hard, and when they're not producing, go back to the start. Pretend you never fished the river before and just fish all those other piers that didn't used to produce. You'll probably find one or two of them that all of a sudden, whatever reason, they're holding fish. All right, go ahead and take us to the next one, Zach. We're moving down the bay now. We're getting towards the middle bay on this next slide. Actually, um, mind if we field some questions that came in? Oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pop them right in, man. So Tim asked, uh, you know, on the Magathy, what should they be targeting in August, September? So August, September, uh, first off, the rock probably aren't going to be what I would call hot in the river just yet, but there will be some around. Uh, my brother's on the Magathy, and he's been catching rockfish off his dock kind of on and off for probably two months now. So you can target them. Uh, the perch are definitely going to be around. That is definitely something you can target. And one of the unique things about the Magathy for a western shore river is that it still has a pretty darn good population of yellow perch. Um, I was at my brother's house, so I guess it was two weeks ago, and just for fun we fished off the pier, and we caught several yellow perch. One of them was pretty darn nice. Uh, so that's another one you can target. Um, when it comes to fishing the Magathy, I got to say I love this. Uh, a perch pounder or a super rooster. The yellow super rooster with the pink polka dots. I don't know what the name of that thing is, but but that, that color pattern. Uh, but that is a killer on that river. It really is. The yellows hit it, the whites hit it, and the rockfish hit it. I will add one other thing. We did find uh, both the last two times I was at my brother's house. If you took the time to scoop up some grass shrimp in a dip net and put them on a shad dart, you definitely caught more fish than just casting a bear anything. You know, the spinner baits, darts, whatever, tube jigs, we're throwing tube jigs. Um, for whatever reason, the, the grass shrimp, were, were, they make a pretty significant difference. So if you're on Dividing Creek, I'm going to guess you can get grass shrimp any old time you want. Just take a dip net, long handle dip net, rub it along some pier pilings, rub it along a boat ramp, rip wrap, anything like that. You'll get grass shrimp in there. Stick them on a shad dart and you'll uh, white perch, yellow perch, rockfish will come up with them all. The Magathy Reef Balls. So, you know, it's really interesting that Wayne would bring up the Magathy Reef Balls. There are a couple really cool reef ball sets. If you don't know where they are, you can find them. Go to fishtalkmag.com, put Magathy River into the search box. Wayne did an article describing them. Um, so I'm very curious as to what they hold right now because the Freshet and I think it was, was it 09, we had the ridiculously rainy spring. Uh, evidently killed all the oysters that were on the reef balls. A buddy of mine has a oyster reef by his house there. They all died. I mean, I think it killed a lot of the oysters clear down in the Severn. Um, for a while there, they were saying on the news that north of the bridge, they just got wiped out. So I really wonder, have they grown back? Now, even if they haven't, those reef balls are still worth, a po worth uh, poking at. And here's why. Um, I think they actually sent divers down, or maybe they dropped a camera. I don't remember which, but they wanted to check them out and see if all those oysters were dead right after that big freshwater blast. And what they found was it did kill off the oysters, but guess what? They had a population boom of those little brackish water mussels. Those things thrive. So you've still got growth. You've still got, you know, kind of the bottom of the food chain happening there. So they may well be a good bet.
Whoops, we had a question there. Oh, there we go. Where are the rockfish biting on right now around the Bay Bridge? No luck money with some bucktails for me. Okay, well, Nathan. Um, first off, don't write off the bucktail just because you didn't have any luck. You could have had a bum day. Tides could have been wacky, whatever, who knows. Uh, I would dress the bucktail with a paddle tail or a twister tail, give it a little bit of extra action. Um, truth be told, uh, if you live line spot, you have your very best chance of catching a rockfish around the bridge. That That's going to be the very best chance. I'm going to say, don't do it. Okay. That's what I'm going to say, because I'm just sick and tired of pulling up 18 inch rockfish that have swallowed a circle hook all the way into their gut and they're streaming blood. Let's face it. It happens. Uh, it's a much more rare event if you're throwing lures. So I'm going to suggest you continue throwing the lures, give it another shot, uh, work those pilings quick. Um, I don't know if you're coming on the west side or the east side, but on the west side, you know, there, it's good to work those four leggers. And then on the east side, you want to keep going east until you get over the channel edge and you got those spider shaped buoys, uh, pilings kind of go like that. Uh, those things hold a lot of fish. Uh, do remember that the really deep water is kind of dead zone-ish right now. So you really want to be fishing like at the very deepest pilings that are in 25 feet of water and probably shallower than that, you know, 18, 20 feet of water, something like that. Um, some other options when there are bigger fish around, you can throw eels at the bridge pilings. That historically is a great way to go. Uh, you can put out some soft crab chunks, peeler crab. Uh, that'll catch them too. But then you kind of get the same problem you get with this live lining spot. You know, the fish are going it, to, it, it's just unavoidable. When you fish in that style, you're going to gut hook some fish. But you know what? I'm not going to knock anybody who wants to go do it. Uh, if you, you're jonesing for fish, you haven't been able to get them, by all means, catch some spot, take them out there, put them down next to the pilings. I would say uh, instead of waiting until the rod bends over, and the circle hook does its thing, you know, maybe only give them like a three count and then begin to slowly reel tight. The real trick with the circle hooks is not so much just not setting the hook as it is that tension gets applied slowly. So like if there, you know there's a fish on the line and you don't want to set the hook, you don't want to leave it in the holder forever so the fish gets in its gut, just slowly reel, slowly apply that tension, and hopefully you'll you'll hook them up. Uh, oh, had a pat of tail on. Okay, good. All the bridge was deep. Oh yeah, yeah. The really deep water right now is not oxygen rich. You, I, I think you're much more likely to find those fish hanging in those you know around those shallower pilings. Uh, if you, if you go to the east side, again, run to the east side until you go over the deep channel and then it starts coming up, 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 and you get to those those crazy spider leg piles and uh, cast around them. That's They're, they're going to be good right now. I think the on the east side, north bridge, the first one is in like 21 feet of wood or something like that, and uh, that, that should be good territory. Woof. I'm running out of breath. We got more questions, Zach, or should we move on? We did, we got some questions while we're in this uh, sort of Anne Arundel County region. Why don't we uh, field this guy? Any reports of snakeheads? Huh. Oh. So, yeah, there are reports of snakeheads in the South River. I have yet to catch one. I have attempted to. There's one snakehead I know of that about five guys have seen, and everybody's trying to catch this same fish. No one's caught it yet. It's in one spot, hangs out in one creek. Everybody's trying to catch it. Nobody can catch it. Um, I haven't heard any reports of big numbers of snakehead. I have through the couple of years now, we've been hearing pretty regular reports of a one here, a one there. Uh, Zach, you might have something to chime in on this because you got roots on the South River and you hear about all this. What do you think? Um, heard lots of sightings and not lots of catches. So it's it's very interesting, just like you're saying, you know, uh, Glebe Creek, Beards Creek, Headwaters, you know, a lot of people are seeing them. So uh, I, I don't know what the what the what the deal is why they're not biting, but they're certainly a, a growing population. Maybe they're getting smarter because they're. I'm telling you, there's one fish in Ramsey that everybody knows is there. Like I've talked to so many different people about this, and we're all like, "Oh yeah, I've tried to catch that fish. Oh yeah, I've tried to catch that fish." Like everybody's trying to catch this fish, 
it hangs out in this one spot by this one pier. Nobody can catch it. Well, if I you can catch it, uh, go back to minute mark four or something where you said the white perch have been decreasing in population in the last few years. Is there a correlation between the decreasing populations of white perch and the growing populations of snakeheads? And why would they eat at my soft plastic when the white perch are around? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to any of those questions. I'm just speculating. <laughs> it's all speculative. All right. Well, um, we have a crabbing question on the Severn, south of the Severn. Uh, you've been I out. Can't speak, uh, was, I can't speak to the Severn. On the south, it was really good for about two weeks. It was horrible for a long time. Then it was really good for two weeks. And now it's gotten hard again. It's not bad, but it's tough because you got so many females and so many mini crabs. The last time I ran my trot line, which was just a week ago, uh, literally like almost every bait had a crab on it. And they were all like this big or female. And then like you get like three crabs a run that were good crabs. What are you hearing from the Severn? Um, I follow some local crabbers and like I think he was – crabbing the Severn quite a bit, and he's starting to move out. So that lets me it slowed a bit as well. That, that would be a hint. <laughs> starting to hit adjacent rivers. So uh, looking for the crabs. All right. Well, uh, we've got a few more questions, but they're they're a little more geographically south. So I think we'll catch, catch up on those as we move down the bay. What do you say? All right. That sounds good. Feel free to pop them in whenever applicable. All right. You ready for the next slide? I am ready. Bring it on. Oh, boy, don't we miss that little guy, right? Croakers. Um, you know, the, I'm not going to say they're coming back because they're not. But there have been two years running now some basically barely keeper-sized croakers around. Uh, you got a better chance on them the farther down the bay you go. Uh, so that's why I put them as we transitioned into middle bay as opposed to upper bay. But there are some showing up up north. Uh, Bottom line, easy fishery, same exact gig as the white perch. Do it, just do exactly the same stuff. Your fish bites, your blood worms, your Chesapeake sabikis, your bottom rigs, your shell bottom, 12 to 18 or 20 feet of water. Just do exactly the same thing, and you're going to catch a mix. Right now, you get a mix of spot, croaker, and white perch. Um, hopefully, we'll see more of these guys. Hopefully, they'll get bigger. Well, you know, fingers are crossed. We'll have to see what happens. All right, go ahead and put me on the next one here, Zach. I love the next one. <laughs> oh, boy. So that black drum is a tributary fish. He was well inside the river. That was in the chop tank. Um, and this goes to the – well, I told you I was going to tell you a story. Here's the story. Uh, about 10 days ago, I had out a different crew for Fish for the Cure. Uh, great crew, wonderful people. We were looking for mackerel and blues out on the bay, and the weatherman had said it was going to be light and variable winds, totally beautiful. So what do you think happened? What do you think? It blew like nuts. We had like 15 to 20 knot winds, and uh, it was just really uncomfortable. And so there were, there were some older folks on board. I'm getting old myself. We decided it would be a good idea to just pop inside the river and get a little bit of cover. So uh, I immediately went to the same spot I got this guy at and dropped the anchor. We put down some soft crab baits and we didn't catch a black. But you know what? We caught rockfish by accident. Uh, we caught a clear nose skate and we caught several really nice honking big toadfish. Hey. <laughs> but the bottom line is when you get into the lower middle bay tribs and the eastern kind of middle middle bay tribs you've got a shot of fish like this what you want to do is you want to anchor down over live bottom it can be reef balls it can be shell uh you know anything like that it can be mussels um anchor over top of it and just drop down some chunks of soft or peeler crab there's not a fish in the bay that's going to turn down softer peeler crab for bait and the black drum absolutely love it um and they're they're they can be around in surprising numbers the day that excuse me the day that we caught this guy we caught uh one other 
and we saw the boat next to us catch two. And that was in just a couple hours of fishing. So they're there in numbers bigger than you might think. And uh, the week before last when we did this, when we, when we ran inside the chop tank to hide from the wind, we did have one big runoff. Now the line broke. The fish dragged it right across the reef balls there. And you could tell because the line was just shredded. When it came up, the last like eight feet of it was just in shreds. Um, I, you know, I don't know what it was. It could have been a lot of things, but it was a big fish. It was not a toad fish. It was much bigger than that. Uh, so you know what? They're there. All right, Zach, why don't you take us to the next one? Here's another really cool one that now, you know, hey, this is a middle base species now. Uh, this shot's in the Patuxent. Uh, uh, I got to credit Eric Packard with taking it and also with introducing me to this fishery. I had never caught these cutlass fish before. And he showed me that in the summertime, in the lower packs, it's nothing to catch a dozen, two dozen in a, in a day of fishing. Uh, it's kind of amazing. So, uh, Kevin, this is this is Solomon's. This is right at Solomon's. Um, this area, I don't care how hard the wind is blowing, you can always get out here. Uh, you can always get out here in a kayak, for that matter, much less a boat. Uh, and all you really need to do is find a relatively deep area. They seem to like the deeper water. 12, 14 feet of water, a channel going into a creek mouth is a good bet, right? Uh, last year when they appeared in the Severn, it was channels to creek mouths. And uh, you can catch them on just about anything. A lot of guys down south like to use uh, plugs for them, plugs that run deep. Uh, they really like paddle tails. Give them a three or four inch paddle tail, they will not turn it down. Now, if you cast a regular paddle tail at them, you will bring back the front half of the plastic and there will be no more tail on it. Uh, these guys have some seriously gnarly teeth. They are great at chomping the plastics right in half. So you really want to be using like your Z-Mans in this scenario, right? You got to use a toothproof plastic. And there are a couple other toothproof plastics now. I forget who makes them. But, but the Z-Mans are reliable. The fish don't bite through them. Uh, you want to put it on like a half ounce jig head, maybe a quarter ounce. Throw it out there. Let it sink all the way to bottom and then keep your tip up and give it kind of a slow steady retrieve with just gentle little jigs they don't like a ton of action they kind of like that slow and steady with the paddle tail just wobbling along and uh they uh they the cr critical point uh when they stop swim they swim backwards once you got them on the line and they'll swim backwards, jerk, jerk, jerk. And when they stop doing that, because they're so long and skinny, it feels like they're gone. You're like, oh, shucks, the hook pulled, right? Don't stop reeling because it feels like they dropped off, but they're still on there. So when it feels like the hook pulls, reel faster, keep tension on the line. And a lot of times you'll take three or four cranks, and then all of a sudden you'll feel it swimming backwards again. Really wild fish. Uh, a lot of guys ask, uh, you know, are they any good to eat? Yes, they are. The fillets are thin. What you do is you just fillet them like any other fish right down the side. You get this incredibly long, skinny fillet. It's like that wide and like that long. Uh, and then take it and roll it up like a pinwheel. Stick a toothpick through it, and then you can make your fish. Uh, they have no scales, so you don't have to scale them, which makes life a little easier when you're cleaning them. And if you're really smart, what you're going to do is you're going to take some crab meat and imperialize it and lay it out along that fillet and then roll it up. Aha, yes, that is going to be difficult to top. They are quite tasty. Yes, yum is right. <laughs> All right, Zach, you want to go ahead and take us on to the next one here? One more for the middle bay. Oh, have you tried the bacon? I have not, but I'll bet that's good. <laughs> I, I can't imagine the bacon pinwheel would let you down. <laughs> All right. Now, the cutlass fish also, while Zach brings up the next slide here, I'm just going to mention, uh, 
this also goes all the way down the bay. Pretty much all the tributaries, all the rivers going down the bay, you can get them in now. Last year, I heard about a bunch from the Chop Tech. I haven't heard about it this year yet, uh, but I'm thinking that's coming soon. And as we continue heading south, naturally, speckled trout is going to be a fish you're going to want to think about. Uh, the tribs are actually better for them than anywhere on the open bay, right? Specks like that shallow water. They like getting in there tight to the structure. Um, I think, I could be wrong, but I think this is a Potomac River fish. But heading south from there, anywhere from there down, uh, you, you got a good shot at specks. Now, they have slacked off a little bit in recent weeks. It's not a surprise. In the heat of summer, often the, the speck bite drops off a little bit. That'll pick back up. Just as soon as we get a couple of nights where it cools off a little bit and it's not like ridiculously hot out, uh, they'll, they'll move back into the shallows and we'll start catching them in better numbers again. Mid-September would be my guess, but it could happen sooner than that easily. And right now you can definitely get them. I think Eric, uh, I want to say he talked to someone in within the last week who had five, uh, which, you know, that's pretty darn good. Uh, nothing wrong with that. How are you going to catch them? Again, we're talking jig heads and plastics, half ounce, quarter ounce, uh, four inch paddle tails. I like the white. I'm a big white fan. Now, a certain somebody who's sitting at his computer right now listening to this and putting things up on the screen schooled me one day with his electric chicken. Uh, he, he did prove that there are times when the electric chicken is the magic. And if you went and looked at my selection of tails right now, you would notice that I have added a, a good number of electric chickens in there. So thank you for that, Zach. Uh, but the whites are great. Um, you just, you know, I would suggest going to Fish Talk Mag and punching specs into the search box and looking at the different stuff about them because there's no one right answer when it comes to a retrieve for specs. Some days they like it fast and crazy. Some days they like it up high. Some days they like it low. Some days they like it slow, just wobbling along. And it, and it changes. It can change from tidal cycle to tidal cycle, much less day to day. So as far as retrieves go, there's no one tactic to point to and say, this is it. Uh, I, we just did an article in Fish Talk last month on the Herky Jerky, or it was, maybe it was more than last month, might have been two months ago, on the Herky Jerky technique. When it works, nothing else works, but it only works about a third of the time. And again, these fish are just, it's crazy how specs change their preferences. So when you get trapped in the trib and you say, hey, I'm going to go chase specs, vary your retrieve radically. Try everything. When you catch a fish, stick with that for a little while. If you don't catch more or the bite slows off, change your retrieve entirely. Uh, interesting little tidbit, and this is true. This is true. I might change my jig color or size, my, my, my paddle tail plastic, if I'm going for specs. I might change it twice in an entire day if I'm having a hard time catching fish, maybe three times if it's a really tough day. But I'll vary my retrieve style a hundred times in the same amount of time. Like every third cast, if I didn't catch a fish, I change my style. So that's definitely a, a critical point. All right. The next one's going to be a surprise. This is going to surprise some people. This is going to surprise some people. Let me, let me interrupt. <clears throat> I have another regionally specific question. Okay. One of which I don't think you'll have any insight on whatsoever. <laughs> I'm gonna it anyway, okay? Hey, pop it up. Oh, St. Mary's. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Tim, your son is going to learn Church Point very well. <laughs> Church Point, when I was at St. Mary's 30 years ago, uh, was kind of like, I'm not sure where I spent more more time, church point or the classroom, church point or the classroom. Now, hopefully your son will do a, you know, do a little better on uh, making his decisions. But uh, church point, uh, there's an oyster bar within casting distance 
outside of it there. And uh, I always did best fishing there with bait. And you could cast out chunks of soft crab, soft chunks of peeler, chunks of bunker. Actually, you'll catch a lot of a lot of bluefish there. You'll catch specks there. You'll catch reds there. If you really want to focus on the specks and reds, uh, get your paddle tail, get your mirror lure, your rattle trap, something like that. Start off up by the riprap near the historic city. Cast along the riprap. Cast along the shoreline. Work your way all the way around the point. On the uh, upriver side of the point, there's a little inlet and a little pond. You want to fish outside of that inlet on a, a, when a very high tide starts to drop and that pond drains out. We used to catch a lot of reds there, a lot of redfish. Um, a lot of weak fish and rockfish used to come up under the school pier at night under the lights. Um, the security guys used to chase us away and tell us we couldn't fish there. So I'm not saying anybody should go fishing there, but maybe check on the current regs. I'm not sure if it's allowed or not at this point. Um, and then there is also a pier you can fish off, off of going up river from there, from the college. It's a small pier, but there are fish around there. And then there's, oh, look, my son's calling me and I forgot to turn off the volume on my cell phone. Dave, we're doing live with Lenny. Sorry about that. Uh, and then on the, a little farther up, there is a creek that cuts in. Again, high tide draining out. Uh, redfish would be waiting at the exit of that little creek for the tide to wash out the crabs, the shrimp, all that stuff. That should all be really good. And Tim, your son, is about to have a fabulous time. My daughter also just graduated from there. Marine science, beautiful. I love it. Congrats. Congrats. That is awesome. So, Zach, you kind of got me there with you. I won't know anything about it then. <laughs> there must be a correlation between anglers and St. Mary's College of Maryland. It just Oh, there definitely is. And is bottom it... line, once you see the campus, if you're a fish head, you're like, oh, uh, yeah, why would I want to go anywhere else? <laughs> I mean, the river's just too much. And then on top of that, you got St. Mary's Lake right up the road. Get a canoe, get a little boat, get a kayak, whatever. That lake is phenomenal. All right. looks like we're all caught up on questions. A few gear uh, gear kind of questions we can hit up towards the end, but uh, I guess we'll just keep moving. Okay. Here's the surprise. Flounder. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Rudo. There's no more flounder, keeper-sized flounder in the bay, right? We got this guy uh, in Cornfield Harbor the year before last. No, actually, I take that back. It was last year. It was last year. And we caught several others that were throwbacks. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They are a great option in the southern tribs. They used to be an even better option. Hopefully they're coming back. I have seen signs of that. We've seen better numbers of smaller ones in recent years. And uh, the cool thing about Cornfield Harbor is that pretty much any time the wind has any north in it, any north in it, um, you can get protection in there. And Cornfield Harbor, is it's kind of big water. I mean, you're in the open Potomac. But you can get protection there. And there are areas like that in the mouth of the Rat, in the mouth of the York, the HRBT, where if you get the right wind direction, it can be blowing 20 knots. The bay can be a thousand percent off limits. But there are certain sections of the river where you can still fish and in comfort, in comfort. <clears throat> what I like to do, uh, and everybody's got their own favorite apps and websites and whatever, I go to Fish Weather, which presents the wind it with arrows right and you click on the arrow and it tells you the speed and they're color coded when you see red you know you know it's going to suck when you see green you know it's going to be okay uh, but i look at those arrows and i kind of judge the closest areas closest to shore and then i try and put two and two together okay are there any good areas that might hold specks and you know specks in there are there any areas that might hold flounder? Judging by those arrows and how the wind is coming across the shore 
and where it's going to leave a little bit of relatively calm water. Uh, this section of uh, Cornfield Harbor, now if it was blown out of the south, southwest, it'd be a blowout. You couldn't do it, right? You couldn't do it. But anything with any north in it, this area is going to be completely calm and absolutely fine, fine to fish. <clears throat> and uh, this same day, we caught keeper flounder, keeper slot redfish, multiples, uh, I think just one speck, and rockfish. And this was all in a location that, like, you know, any kind of north in the wind, you can fish it out of just about any kind of boat. So look at those arrows. Look for your cover. Uh, Kevin's asking about the preferred flounder bait. Uh, so I used to be a mid squid, mid and squid, <laughs> minnow and squid fan. And then I became a uh, Berkeley Gulp jerk shad fan. And what I've found since is the Berkeley Gulp, <sighs> taxing myself trying to remember all this at once. The twister tail is called a swimming mullet. The swimming mullet it seems to me works the best for flounder in the ocean. If you're drifting the reefs and the wrecks, you put on your swimming mullet on flute killer rigs, top and bottom flute killer rigs. It kills them. It crushes them. But in the bay, in the shallower areas, and also fishing like watch a break, chicken take, those areas where it's shallow. Still my favorite, I think, is the four-inch – jerk shad the gulp jerk shad because you can put that on a light head and give it a great action and that's a total killer that's a total killer on the flounder the gulps really do work good on though you know i have some new ones the uh oh help me up zach what are the flavored baits uh the fish bite fish bites uh boxer or something like that. yes the fish bites dirty boxer fish bites has come out with its own line of like Twister tails, soft plastics that are scented with fish bites. And we all know that stuff works. So I'm dying to try it. I haven't been flounder fishing since I got my hands on a package. I haven't been able to try it yet. I will report back when I when I do. I but caught, I, I have high hopes for that. I caught a few on those in Ocean City this summer. They were undersized, but they worked. Flounder? Yep. Oh, very cool. Okay. Okay. I, I was I had high hopes for him. Like I say, that's great to hear. That's excellent. What do you think <clears throat> of artificial crabs? Tim, I have heard they're really good. I have bought maybe three packs through the years. I have yet to catch a fish on them. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me. Other people have told me they've caught fish on them. I have not caught fish on them. That's kind of in a nutshell. I don't know what else to say. I, don't, I just don't know more than that. <laughs> I remember some years ago, people were using them as a substitute for soft crab when the black drum were at the stone rock. And at least two different people told me they caught fish on them and they worked. And I tried them and I didn't catch a fish on them. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, it is what it is, you know, man. <laughs> I haven't tasted them yet. I might have to taste them, see if they're any different from the uh, jerk shed. Mm. Yeah. I was going to taste the fish bites, and the guy was like, no, don't do that. Or no, wait, was that a different gulp product? It's the new gulp product. The new gulp product, yeah. Yeah, the guy highly discouraged it to the point that he would not hand me the packet of lures when I said I was going to taste them. So take that for what you will. <laughs> All right, pop us on to the next one, man. There it is. There it is. Everybody wants one. <laughs> Everybody wants two or three. Uh, again, this is another species farther south to go, the better shot you got. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, some years we get them all the way up to the Severn. Now, I haven't seen that happen in a couple few years. Uh, but Potomac South, you got a shot. 
really Pianki Tank, Rappahannock, that zone. Once you get down that far, you got a really good shot. Um, how are you going to fish for them? Uh, really not very different from the specs, uh, really, in Rockfish. I, I like the four inch paddle tail. Now, there's one big difference with the redfish, with the, the slot reds. And again, that goes to the retrieve. And maybe this is just me. I don't know. Other people may have found different. But I have definitely found that when I really nail the slot reds, it's bouncing along the bottom with, with the jig, as opposed to retrieving up in the water column. Every jig of the rod, I'm waiting to feel it tap back down the bottom. And this makes it critical to have braid line, a sensitive rod, a light rod, uh, and, and honestly, just some experience. You got to be able to feel that jig tap down. And the moment it taps, you got to pop it back up. And generally speaking, I find what happens is when the reds smack it, uh, you go to jig it back up. And it's just, it's like hitting a brick wall and then the brick wall decides to drive away. That's kind of the feeling there. Um, but I definitely find that bouncing it on the bottom works better for the reds. A uh, lot of guys ask about scents. I do think you do better with a scented bait. The gulp is probably a good move. Um, I, I, I have definitely had good luck on them with the straight up white paddle tails that I use for rockfish, the killer jigs. Um, but I think what that scent does for you is once the fish grabs it, it doesn't want to let go. So it grabs it and then it eats it. And like once it decides to attack and gets on it, it's, you know, it's getting it. So I think that may give you a little bit of an edge. But again, four inch paddle tails, your straight tails, your jerk shed, that kind of thing. Just change that retrieve up a little bit and pop it off the bottom. Let it sink. Pop it off the bottom. Let it sink. Pop it off the bottom. Let it sink. Just for the record, same tactic works really good for the reds uh, at the power plants uh, in the late, late, late fall. When they get stuck in there, that's the way to get them. All right. Now, I got another slide coming up. It's an important slide. It's going to be tough to see. Go ahead and bring it up, Zach. Let's see it. <clears throat> All right. So this is my dad on my boat. I believe it was his last, a second last fishing trip uh, before we lost him. Uh, but I wanted to bring up this slide for two reasons. First is you can see it's kind of rough. It's not incredibly rough, but it was kind of a rough day. Uh, at the time, my dad was 85 or 86, right around there. Uh, and me and my brothers, knew we you know we just, we weren't going in the bay you, you just you know we couldn't bounce them around like that uh so we stayed in the south and we had a great day and if you end up locked into the tribs what you see him holding there the fish is attached to is critical that is a i think it's a three-quarter ounce but it might be a half ounce half ounce or three-quarter ounce uh rattle trap uh, you can't, you can see it in the picture when you blow it up, but you can't really see it here. I've taken the trebles off and replaced them with single hooks. Important because the trebles are going to wreck throwback fish. They're, they're, they, you know, they really chew them up and you do get probably a higher ratio of throwbacks in the river using these. So you really want to swap that treble out for a single. Plus it's safer. Our friend Eric Packard, he got the treble and the hand treatment a few weeks ago. Uh, less likely to have to happen with the singles. Um, and this one lure, when you're stuck in a trip, if you cast it out really hard, take a really good hard long cast, and then leave the bale open, whip the rod back one time, and then close the bale, stick in a rod holder, and troll it at about three miles an hour. That sucker is going to catch fish. Go ahead and take us to the next slide, Zach. Let's look at the next one, too, here, side by side with it. So here is the uh, blue and chrome. The other was the pink and chrome. Um, this is a standard product shot, which is why there are trebles on there. It's not a picture I took. And next to it, you see the paddle tail with a tandem rig. Um, if you set out a rattle trap on one rod and take a tandem rig with like a one-ounce head and a 
and a two ounce head and a four inch paddle tail on it. And you throw that out on the other side of the boat and you put those rods down in the holders. You're almost surely going to start catching fish. It is just a really good tributary fallback tactic when it's blowing out and it's hard to fish. The, the day from that we were showing you before from when my dad was holding up the rockfish, um, even in the river, it was really just too rough to try and locate the fish, stop the boat, and cast to them. We, just, we would have rolled around too much. Uh, but trolling, you can go upwind, and then you can turn around and go downwind. And it can be pretty darn comfortable, especially in the tributary. You know, you, you really, it's not like you're going to rock and roll at all. Um, and now on a really windy day, I do trim down the lines. I might put out three. I might try, a, you know, a couple rattle traps one on each side and the jigs down the middle, uh, something like that. But on a really windy day, I don't like to put out a whole lot of lines because the wind blows them around and you end up, you know, you end up tending to get tangles. So, but just the two, just the, the, the tandem rig on the one side and the rattle trap on the other. Troll that up and down the channel edges of any tributary on the bay at three miles an hour. You've got a really good chance of catching decent fish. It is just, it's a fact. It's a really, really good windy day tributary fallback tactic. Woof. All right. Made it through that picture. Uh, Zach, do we have any more questions popping up at this point in time? Uh oh, Zach, did we lose Zach? Sorry, I was muted. Um, there's a couple that we're going to circle back to. Uh, kind of heading back up to the. Uh, let's see. I guess, you know, not necessarily the Bay Bridge, but really, uh, we talked earlier about uh, Bucktails at the bridge, and he had another follow up about. Yeah, bridge. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Jig Head. I'd start with an ounce. Uh, I might use three quarters on a lame tide. I might use an ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half on a really rushing tide. But an ounce is about right. Uh, four four inch paddle tail um, is going to be perfect for that. You could use a three. You could use a five. It's not a, you know, it's not a monster deal. People sometimes they they want like really exact. What do you do? But you know, it's fish. It's fishing. There's no like one answer, you know, if you have a paddle tail between three and five ounces and a jig head between three quarters and an ounce and a half, you got a good shot at fish. Trim that down. We'll say an ounce and a four incher. Um, let it sink. Let it sink after it hits the water. Uh, you know, first cast, I might give it a three count, then a five count, then a 10 count. Make sure it hits bottom. You know, do something like that. Try, you know, run through that as you're as you're casting at the bridge. And then when you hook a fish, you, you got to keep track of what you're doing in your head. If you gave it a five count and then you started retrieving and boom, you got a hit, you know, that brain's got to click and go, OK, my next cast, I'm doing a five count. You know, my next 10 casts, I'm doing a five count. And then if I'm not getting any more hits, maybe I'll try a 10 count. Maybe I'll try one with no count. Move it around, but uh, yeah. All right. Um, we have a gear recommendation from Gary. Looking for a new rod and reel. I believe. What is a D Fuego? I'm not even familiar with that. You know that? that? It's a Daiwa. Ah, uh, okay. Price I gotta say. So. Truth of the matter is, I'm not incredibly familiar with the Daiwa gear. I'm kind of a Shimano guy. Uh, I, I've used it a lot, and I really, really, really like it. It doesn't break on me, which I'm, I'm a big uh, reliability guy. Like, that's, like, way high on my list. Uh, so I like the Stratic, the 3500. It's kind of my pick for this type of fishing, right, uh, for the Jigging for Rock. Um but, you know, Daiwa has a good rep, and that may well be a great reel for it. Now, as far as the rod goes, a 7.6 is long to me. Plenty of really good anglers I know like that longer rod. You will get more casting distance with it. I'll tell you why I'm not in love with it. I like more like a 6 or a 6.6, six, six, so I like it a lot shorter. 
And the reason for that is I do a lot of boat fishing. I'm a klutz. I tend to swing my rod into T-tops and VHF antennas and stuff like that. That kind of thing happens a lot less with a shorter rod than with a longer rod. Uh, when my kids were casting on the boat, I, I made sure every rod on the boat was like six or less uh, because kids can be very destructive with long rods and, and long arcs of destruction as they cast. Um, but, you know, feel free to go for the 7.6. Nothing wrong with it. I think my very favorite is, is probably the, the six foot medium light St. Croix, uh, right, you know, or thereabouts. I, and also, I should say, I like things light, you know. Once you go over, well, shucks, you go over an ounce, you start to tax that rod. You, you go to two ounces, you're really putting it to the test to try and use a two ounce head with it. So, um, you know, that might be right. Now, the one thing I want to add to that, if you're talking jigging, two critical points. One, make sure you get braid. No money for jigging. Braid, 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 braid. Two, uh, fast action. Definitely. Definitely. Fast action rod is very advantageous for jigging. If you were going to say, I'm going to go bait fishing half the time, I'd say, eh, you know, maybe not such a fast tip. But jigging, yeah, you want that fast action. I hope that covered it. I'm so tempted to turn around and grab some of this stuff because <laughs> I've got all my rods right back here. You, know, you got the, the rod recommendations. What about a boat? What's the perfect size boat for the chest? Oh, perfect size boat. There's First off, there's no answer to that question. And anybody who tells you they've got the answer is just wrong. Um, I've got a 16-foot boat that I absolutely love for fishing in the tribs and I'll poke out in the bay when it's really calm and I use it for, for use it for crabbing. It's the ideal boat for me. I've also got a 22 foot glacier bay that I run out into the bay and it's the ideal boat for me. I've got a 26 canvas on order. I think it's going to be the ideal boat for me. You know, there, there's no one answer. There truly is not. Uh, what you got to do, Gary, is you got to go to the boat shows, right? The, the Annapolis boat show is coming up. When is it, Zach? Do you know the dates? Uh, second week of October, so that is uh, so it's not that far off. And what you got to do is you got to go to the boat shows and you got to get on and off of a ton of boats, and you got to kind of wrap your head around what's going to be best for you personally because it really is different for everybody personally. You know, my, my dad had a 28. Personally, for him, it was the right boat. He didn't go into the shallows. He, he would go out into the bay proper and kind of fish charter boat style. And it was a perfect boat for him. Uh, it, it would drive me nuts. It would drive me nuts because that boat had a three and a half foot draft. And you could not go into shallow water with it without scaring half the fish within casting distance anyway. Um, so it wouldn't be right for me, but it was great for him. Um, some people say there's a certain length boat that spans the waves on the bay the best. Personally, I think that's a crock. I, I've been on, well, my boat, my 22. Zach, you've been on my 22. You've been on it plenty of times. I'm going to put the question to you. I'm not even going to say it. Does the bay have anything to throw at it that that 22-foot boat can't handle? That, that boat can handle anything in the Chesapeake Bay. It can. And beyond. <laughs> The bay can't throw anything at it that it can't handle. It, it really can. And it's a 22-foot boat. It's kind of amazing, but it's true. Now, that doesn't always mean it's going to always be comfortable. But, you know, you can have a three- to four-foot sea condition that you can run through no problem in that boat, but you still can't fish it. And the truth of the matter is you can be on a 35-foot boat, and you can be just fine in that sea condition, but guess what? You still can't really fish it very well. You can troll it. Yeah, if you want to troll, you, you can do that. That's why, the, the you know, the charter boats can fish the open bay through, you know, a lot of different weather conditions. But they're trolling. On the flip side, they can't get into the shallows and fish shallow. I got to say, buying a boat is like a very hyper-personal kind of decision. Everybody likes different things about fishing and fishing different ways and targeting different species and going in different conditions. It, it's all, it's hyper personal. 
sorry, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have like a solid kind of answer for you. <laughs> I don't think it exists. And, and and when people say you know X size boat is what you need for the bay, I don't I don't think they really necessarily understand. You know all the little factors coming into play and different feelings people have. Uh, you know, I've had there, I, I have lived for time periods with an 18 foot boat and fished it on the bay regularly and been perfectly happy with it. Oh my God, Robert Robinson, you are so right. You are a thousand percent on target. It's why you need more than one boat. Yes, you really need two, and three is probably better. <laughs> I'm so glad he chimed in with that. That is dead on. About, we're just about at our hour mark. Uh, we did have a few more questions. Uh, what do you want to do? One more question? Sure. Lightning round them. Just lightning round them. I'll be brief. All right. Okay. A question from Dom Williams. Will bluefish come into the large trips? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not in the same numbers. You know, but yeah, they'll come in. You tend to find not the mass schools, you know, that are churning water like nuts, like you're out in the bay, but it's more like you get one here, you get one there. And sometimes they will push into the chop tank, you know, not like way up, but they will come up. Absolutely. Potomac will go up. Oh, yeah, sure. Ding. <laughs> Any predictions for pickerel season on the Magathy? Hook some last week. For so I've been hearing that all summer. I have been hearing from folks who have been like fishing for rockfish perch and they're catching pickerel. And that's great. It should be a good season. The Magathy and the Severn and the Baltimore uh, creeks, uh, you know, Marley, Stone Rock, all those creeks up there. They've all been on the upswing, the, 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 the middle to northern bay, western shore tribs have been on the pickerel upswing. I'm going to say for like three years now, maybe even four, um, they, they, they've been improving steadily. And, uh, you know, they go through cycles and we're in an upswing. So hopefully it'll be a good year. Thing. What's a fish you'd like to flick a line for but haven't caught yet? Oh, huh. What do I want to catch that I haven't caught yet? That's a tough question. Uh, you know, I'm really jealous of the guy that got the Opa out of Ocean City. I like. I think that's so super cool. Like, I can't even hardly wrap my head around it. That's definitely one I'd like to catch. Um, Have you got a, a, a true muskie? No, actually, my muskie have all been tiger muskie. Mm. So that's actually a good point. That would be a cool one to get. But the problem is it's the fish of 10,000 casts, and I don't want to make 10,000 casts for anything. <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger and more ambitious, maybe. <laughs> I don't, you know, okay, wait. No, I got one. I got one that I've never caught, that I've always wanted to catch. Freshwater drum. Mm. Yep. There are drum that look just like big, giant, silver, black drum that are all freshwater. I think they're in like the the Mississippi Basin, somewhere out there, out west. Uh, I do want to catch one of them, but I don't want to go west. I really don't. Do I have to go west of the edge of Maryland? I, I think not. Eh. Northern King at Cedar Point. Oh, nice. That That's pretty darn far north to see one. That really is. Um, they're, they're awesome fish. Uh, wow, Cedar Point, Kingfish. I, that's about as far north as I've ever heard of one, honestly. That's cool. All right. Inline hooks. Okay, so Kevin, thank you. Uh, yeah, the trebles a damage the fish. Like if you're if you if you're gonna catch a throwback fish and you got to dig a treble out, it can be a lot more damaging to the fish. It can also, on rare occasions, actually pin the fish's mouth closed, where one tiny of the treble goes into the roof of the mouth and two go into the bottom of the mouth. You can't even open the fish's mouth to get the hook out. That's gonna be a dead fish. It's going to be a dead fish, uh, no matter how hard you try. Uh, so that's reason number one. Reason number two is that it's more dangerous for you. Those trebles, they swing around. They get stuck in your hand. Like I mentioned, Eric got one in the hand a couple weeks ago. Now you're 
you're probably going to the hospital. You know, if you got a trouble in there, more than one point, you, you're not going to be able to get it out yourself. So swapping out the trebles for the singles is a very good idea, really in all cases, not just your rattle traps, but like, oh, well, well, you, you know what? Wait a minute. Hold on. Here we go. Right here, sitting on my desk, I happen to have a top water lure with singles. I swap them out on, you know, everything. Um, it's you don't you don't miss that many more strikes. It's like at first you get a hit or two and you miss it and you think, oh my gosh, did I just miss it because I don't have trebles? But then you catch a fish, and then you miss it, and then you get a fish. And then after a while, you start thinking, you know, is it really any different? I'm not so sure it is. It, it really seems kind of about the same. I mean, they miss the treble sometimes too, you know? And um, I, I'm not sure I can even really tell a really big difference between the ones with the singles and the one with the trebles. So it's it's definitely a good move, particularly now when we're trying really hard not to kill all these little rockfish. It's, uh, yeah, hey, well, yeah, trebles is trouble for anglers' fingers. It's absolutely true. As far as the um, the previous question from Sandy Toes, uh, New song. York Lakes. Ooh, I can go north. Buffalo Drum. Yeah, I've heard them call that called that too. So that, that's Lake Erie. Wow, I didn't know they were in Lake Erie. But I'm liking this this thought that maybe I can just go north instead of going west. Less humidity, cooler weather. Yeah. Well, of course, I still don't want to go north of the Pennsylvania line, but you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? All right, uh, Gary wants to know where you'll be uh, speaking next. I know you have some upcoming uh, English meetings and whatnot. I do, I do. Give me half a second here. Uh, September. I will be at the Kent Island Anglers Club, 7.30 uh, on Kent Island. Um, oh, is it at the Lions or the – I think it's the American Legion there. Steve, but don't cross – Yeah, Stevensville, American Legion on Route 8. American Legion on Route 8. Great. Thank you, Zach. Uh, and then on the 14th at the Frederick Anglers Club, which is out in Frederick, Maryland – uh, which is about as far west as I like to go, <laughs> unless I'm going ice fishing. But um, I'm not sure where they hold their meeting, but if you Google Frederick Anglers Club, I'm sure you can find it. <clears throat> and one more tip for freshwater drum, Oneida Lake. Oneida Lake. Where's Oneida Lake? Help me out. Don't know yet. <laughs> Sounds like New York to me. This, this is a question of how quickly can Zach Google it's New York, upstate New York. New York, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a road trip in order. Sure, you know. I haven't fished the Finger Lakes in many years. It's been a long time. So maybe it's time. I don't have to get it on, on an airplane to go there, right? I can just drive. I think it took like eight hours the last time I went up there. Lake Cuca. We went to Lake Cuca. I've been to Lake Cuca, the Finger Lakes. You've been to Lake Cuca? Yeah, my friend has a house there. He got married there. Nice. They have a lot of wine up there. They have a lot of lake trout up there. Yeah. I remember that. <clears throat> We're there for three days. The first day, we didn't catch a darn thing. The second day, we began to figure it out. We caught a handful of fish. And the third day, we had to figure it out. We slaughtered them. It was really cool. Very fun. An interesting new challenge. Um. One last question about the uh, the inline hooks. Is there a single style that's become your go-to? I believe I like – I tend to get the VMCs. I was hoping you would know the name because they do have the eye. The eye is different. The eye, the eye is like in line with the shank. VMC inline uh, are the ones that um, I like. I, I believe that's what I'm holding up right now. Because that that eye, it's not turned sideways. It's it's in line with the shank, so they swing like that. And I I think you're right. I think these are VMCs. But that's the critical thing: is that the eye be in line with the shank, as opposed to like sideways to it. Woo! I know Zach's scanning the questions right now. Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? 
lots of questions, lots of comments. I just want to say thanks to everyone for tuning in. Lots of, uh, if we didn't get to your questions, we're sorry, we'll try to get to them in post. But um, just one. Yeah. Sorry. I will force myself to go to Facebook and scan scan down and see if I see anything we missed. Hopefully we got it all. Sorry for my cave. I, don't, I can't seem to get, I have three lights on in here. I can't yeah, see. it looks like all your lights are out. I have three lights on. I can't figure out what's going on. My camera's all off or something. Yeah, your computer's broken. Awesome. Uh, it, it is old. Give it a good sturdy whack. No. <laughs> Just want to give everyone a, one last reminder and a thanks to Suzuki Marine. If you visit fishtalkmag.com slash Suzuki, you can find a whole bunch of Chesapeake and Atlantic dealers as well as a handy map to find one in your region. So if you're looking for repower, looking for service, uh, check it out. Look at that beautiful bay with that awesome shape. There's just nothing like it. Absolutely. Rocking. Well, right. thank you, Zach, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We'll see you next month, first Thursday of the month, and uh, stay tuned.